Hey everybody, how's it going? I want to thank you for all the work that you've done to make people aware of the bullshit arguments used in opposition to right to repair. There are actual opposition arguments that may make sense. The problem is that a lot of them are often made in horrible bad faith because they know they are speaking to legislators that either don't know any better or are paid off. And in the rare cases that these things actually go out for a vote amongst normal, ordinary citizens, right to repair usually wins by a landslide if people are properly informed. And one of the problems in Massachusetts is that there was a severe disinformation campaign that was put forth by this organization called Coalition for Safe and Secure Data. As you can see over here, thanks to all of you doing your part in informing people of what we talk about here on this channel, Right to Repair One so it was about 75% in favor and 25% opposed. And the organization that put a lot of money into this was the Coalition for Safe and Secure Data. Cash contributions, 26 million, total, you know, quite a bit of money was put into this. And you can see that General Motors, Toyota, Ford, Honda, Nissan all put money into this because they don't want you to be able to fix your, your own car. And th this organization put out a lot of garbage that I went over in some of my other videos. Here, you can see that there is a woman. She is walking to her car. And as she walks to her car, there was some freaky music playing in the video. You got the shaky cam, and then she turns around right as someone's about to assault her. Because that's what's going to happen if people have the ability to work on their own cars. They will use fear-mongering in order to scare people into voting against their interests. And I wanted to go over how this is continuing to happen. Just because a disinformation lost once doesn't mean that organizations are not going to keep trying. And all of you informing the people that you know in your own personal lives about these issues is why right to repair passed in Massachusetts. And I, these types of things cannot happen without the help of everybody in the audience. There's a new organization that's doing something similar, and I wanted to go through some of their points and point out why they are, they are bullshit. And every time these come out, I'm going to do a corresponding video where I go through them with you in detail, and we can talk about why they are bullshit. So this comes from another organization that you can, it's kind of similarly named. That one was the Coalition for Safe and Secure Data that made it sound like if, you, you know, your, your mechanic is able to fix your car, they'll also be able to track you, kill you in a parking lot, and, you know, dump you somewhere while your body is frozen in Richard Kuklinski style, here you have the Security Innovation Center, and they have a list of myths and facts on right to repair that I'd like to read for you all. When we check out their website, you can see on the website for the Security and Innovation Center that industry partners include CTA, that's Charlie Brown, and uh, you know you, you can uh, check out my channel to see some of the stuff he said about how people are going to have TikTok installed on their phones when screens get replaced by unauthorized service centers, CTIA, who has repeatedly BSed on right to repair, the Entertainment Software Association, which I believe had a lobbyist say that the, the game will play the console, that's how informed they are, and uh, TechNet who has frequently shown up at anti-right to repair hearings. This is a group or a conglomerate that is very friendly to people who are against right to repair, who typically use fear-mongering, horrible arguments that I have recorded, filmed, and responded to at legislatures across the country on a regular basis. But it's time that we start making sure that the, it's better known that these organizations are designed and created to push misinformation, that they are actually branded as organizations that regularly push misinformation. So let's get started on that. The first myth, consumers have limited choice and availability for securing, repairing, for securely repairing internet connected products. Fact, consumers have access to vast and rapidly growing networks of trained, skilled, and secure repair providers across the country that are competing for their business. This includes local retail stores and the manufacturer, mail and repair services, and authorized third-party services, all of which provide a range of repair options with varying levels of price, convenience, and quality. Now, they're saying it's a myth that consumers have limited choice for securely repairing their products. Uh, that's not a myth. That, that's a fact. And it's easy to demonstrate by simply calling the manufacturer and asking how these things work. So this is something that I did in a video a few years ago. You could see it here. What does authorized repair do? Let's find out. In this video, what I did for almost an hour is I called up a bunch of different authorized repair shops that were listed on the manufacturer's website 
and asked them what the repair options were for certain devices. Uh, at best, I would be given options that were almost the price of purchasing that device again, or I had to mail it in and they were just going to replace it. And at worst, they would just give me flat out in misinformation. So for instance, on an iPhone 6, I was told that you could not replace the headphone jack because it was hard soldered to the board. Even if it was hard soldered to the board, it can be replaced. But it's not hard soldered to the board. There's a little flex cable that costs about $5 on most websites that even Jess's toddler children have been able to replace on their own without screwing up the phone. That's a ridiculous point. And throughout the video, every authorized repair center, in some way, shape, or form, are giving me horrible options that are often filled with misinformation, and they're just bad for the consumer. This is something that happens virtually across the industry. I mean, it, this, this is why independent mechanics exist, because people don't want to go to the dealer and pay two to $6,000 for something that their mechanic down the block can solve for 79 bucks. This is something that most people that have dealt with a dealer and then an independent mechanic uh, figure out fairly quickly. And this is something that they call a myth. It is not a myth. It is indeed a, a fact if you actually try to get many of these devices fixed. It says, consumers may also opt to use many of the independent repair service providers or repair their own products, though they do so without the quality assurance provided by the using a manufacturer's authorized provider. Uh, semi-true, but also semi-untrue. They're able to use independents, but the independents are purposely kneecapped so that they're not able to do their job. So one of the thing videos I did uh, several times was this one on this particular chip, the ISL 9240. So in many of these videos, you see me fixing MacBooks where there's been a problem with the MacBook where the it kills the charging chips. You have a $3,000 machine. I replaced a three or 15 or $20 chip inside the $3,000 machine and I make it work again. Depending on where, you know, where the business is, some businesses charge 100, some 300, some 500, some six. It depends on their business model and also where they're located. But anywhere between the cost of that chip and the, what the manufacturer's charging for a new one is the room for there to be a better price. And independent repair offers that. However, independent repair is not able to at new devices because what the manufacturers will do is they will go to the chipset manufacturers and say, don't make this chip available to anybody else. So technically, we as independent repair providers do exist, and technically they can come to us to get our stuff fixed, but... If you have used monopolistic power to cut off our ability to actually purchase the chips to do our job, then how is it that we're able to provide that? It's kind of like saying, I mean, technically they can buy food from anywhere they want and then telling all of the farmers, uh, don't, don't sell any of your products to Whole Foods. I mean, yeah, technically they can go to the store, but there's not going to be any food for them there because you have told everybody not to sell to that particular store. I mean, and th this is this is something that is particularly aggravating. They're saying, "Oh yeah, we're not we're not stopping you from going there. We're just stopping you from uh, from from the place that you're going to go to from actually having the ability to do the job that we're also not willing to do ourselves." Next, it says here, "Repair legislation is consumer friendly and only has positive benefits." Fact. Repair legislation that was proposed and defeated in 19 states in 2018. See, what they're doing there is they're priming you to believe that because it was defeated, it must be bad. That was proposed and defeated. It couldn't be that it was defeated because you use lobbyist money to convince politicians to throw it away. It couldn't be that you misinformed people that didn't know any better. It must be that it was just defeated, you know, like a, like a boxing match where you trained more or something. Would have gifted hackers with digital keys to thousands of internet-connected products, including smartphones, televisions, security cameras, fire alarms, Wi-Fi routers, computers, personal assistant devices, thermostats, refrigerators, video game platforms, and more. While forcing manufacturers to share proprietary information and source code might lead to some independent repair technicians being able to repair broken products, that limited potential benefit will be overwhelmed by the substantial harms posed to consumers. So here you actually have two myths in their fact section. None of the right to repair bills that have been presented in any state to this point have asked for source code. Not a single right to repair bill proposed in the United States of America in any state has ever asked for source code. This is a lie. This is a duplicitous, bold-faced, disgusting, immoral lie. We have never asked for that. Further, anybody who is into security, and I shouldn't even be moving into this section of the argument, because admittedly this is something where I would be accepting the premise of an asshole by even going there, 
But anybody who's into security would say, if revealing the source code makes your program less secure, it was not secure to begin with. I mean, just look at not, how much of the internet runs on Unix and Linux-based servers and systems. Some of them, the systems that we expect to be the most secure are run on open source software. But that aside, we're not actually asking for source code. We've never asked for source code, making this completely moot. And you see how they are saying fire alarm, security cameras, uh, thermostats, or, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to scare you into thinking that I'm going to, as a result of being able to have right to repair so that I could fix your phone and I can buy a charging chip for when it dies rather than you having to buy a new one. Somehow that's going to allow me to secretly dial up the temperature in your house while you sleep until you burn in your bed, which is clear and utter fear mongering and bullshit. Next, there are no security or privacy risks associated with an unauthorized repair shop. Myth! Independent repair shops do not require the intensive security and safety training that is mandatory for authorized repair networks. Without those protections, there is no way to ensure unauthorized repairs will not introduce new security and safety vulnerabilities, endangering consumers' privacy, or even allowing their products to be taken over remotely. If you have a... Um, if you have a cell phone and you give me that cell phone in order to fix an issue on its motherboard and you don't give me the password to the phone, I can't get into the phone. If you want me to fix an issue where your phone is not charging, you don't have to give me your password to make that happen. If you want me to change the screen on your phone, you don't need to give me the password. I would like the password on, on occasion so that I could test that the earpiece works, test that the microphone still works, test that all the functions that worked at the beginning still work at the end of the repair so that you, the consumer, can just you know go to a restaurant for 20 minutes and then when, you're, when you come back, get back a fully working phone. But if you don't want to do that, you don't have to give me access to any of what I would need in order to actually introduce security issues in your device. There are virtually no known cases in an industry that's a four or six billion dollar a year industry of people introducing security flaws into devices. And when you really look at it from a macro standpoint, I mean, again, when you look at how people's iCloud photos and everything were hacked several years ago, where lots of celebrities and people's personal data were leaked, this is not something that happens because of an independent repair shop. The security flaws that exist in these devices exist because virtually everything that is created is secure up until the moment that it isn't, and virtually everything at some point is hackable. It's not hackable because of us. And frankly, it's up to you as a consumer to choose whether or not you want to deal with an authorized repair shop versus an unauthorized repair shop. It's not up to them to protect you from yourself. They're pretending that they care about protecting you from yourself. But yeah, the idea that because I fix, I replace your phone screen or I replace your battery, that I am now installing backdoors into your device, I, we, we should be going over the fact that backdoors are built into many of these devices stock. I mean, honestly, if most people believe that, you know, Microsoft hasn't handed the NSA and other agencies, you know, keys into their operating system so that they could be hacked at any point in time, they're, they're fooling themselves. I mean, at some point, Samsung, uh, Samsung smart TVs actually had a backdoor in them. And I forget the exact name. Some, uh, please, if someone can bring it up down below. It was, a, it was a series of leaks that were released several years ago where the, these Samsung smart TVs were actually able to be used for surveillance by certain branches of government. And th th these, th this has nothing to do with independent repair. The backdoors in these devices are not being caused by independence. Even if an internet-connected product is compromised at an insecure repair shop, this would not present a threat to personal safety. Myth. Fact. A compromised internet-connected product can cause far more harm than stolen passwords or data theft. Cybercriminals can take over smart home devices to unlock your front door, communicate with a child, or disable a security camera to break into your home unnoticed. Further, consumers need to have assurances that their internet-connected products have been fixed by a skilled professional. They depend on products such as smoke detectors and alarm systems for literal life or death matters. There... This... The, we Communicate with... So again, like you, you hear what's get, you hear where this is going, right? So you you have a, a if you hire someone to put if you hire a third party service provider to, to put cameras in your home, they are going to now try to communicate with your kids and evilly try to you know this is this this is fear mongering this is fear mongering 
And the idea that, honestly, anybody who's going to go so far as to install a security system in your house that allows them to unlock your front door, that person is a criminal. And criminals work for authorized repair providers as well as working for unauthorized repair providers. This argument could be made for virtually anybody. And if, frankly, if you want a, a device that unlocks your front door to be installed and you don't trust anybody to do it, and you're afraid of criminals uh, working out there, there are criminals that are going to be working at virtually any organization. You, that, that's, that this, this is frankly being ridiculous. And the idea that they are talking about life or death matters when we're talking about the ability to repair the devices you own, again, they really are pouring on the fear-mongering here as hard as humanly possible because they know that they cannot win the arguments in, in, in the realm of what, what's actually realistic. So they, they focus on whatever is going to scare you. Fear, uncertainty, doubt. Fear, uncertainty, doubt. Fear, uncertainty, doubt. Now BlackBerry's scared too. Fact. Internet-connected products are so easy to fix, so consumers don't need to go to authorized repair shops. Myth. Internet-connected products are designed with complex technology, such as lithium-ion batteries that can present serious safety hazards when unauthorized or counterfeit parts are used. That's why manufacturers have strict requirements around safety training and technical expertise for their repair technicians. By opening repair networks to untrained professionals, the proposed legislation would jeopardize the safety of both products and consumers. So we're making the argument here with the lithium. And again, the argument here is that lithium-ion batteries can explode. I know. Uh, the, the reality here is that we already have, a, have over $4 billion repair industry here. How many repair shops are dragged to court? How many repair shops are blamed for people's devices exploding on a regular, regular basis? Like, how often are we actually seeing this happen? How often are we, and further, when it comes to safety hazards, when we're talking about this, we need to acknowledge the fact that in this country, we have acknowledged the fact that free, we, we value freedom over safety in this particular regard. If you want to go down an auto zone and purchase brake pads for your car, you are able to purchase those brake pads for your car. You are able to then install them in your car. You are then able to drive that car 70 miles an hour on the highway. Now, would this present a safety concern if I did it? Yes, because I've never driven a car and I have no idea to replace the brakes in a car. There's a good chance that I would screw it up doesn't change the fact that we have accepted this. So we are willing to accept freedom in these areas that, that are just fundamentally grandfathered into our culture, but now we're afraid of, uh, of, of being able to open a phone because it has a lithium-ion battery in it. And further, this is something that is already happening. It's not like if this legislation doesn't pass that repair is going to go away. There are repair shops in every city, in every town in this country that are repairing devices every single day by the tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands, probably millions. And how often do you see this on the news? How often do you see on the news this phone blew up as a result of this? If anything, more of these, these devices have been on the news for blowing up because the manufacturer manufactured it poorly, like the Samsung Note 7, or like the A1398 MacBook Pro from 2015 where a battery exploding went on Reddit, more so than them being on the news because someone repaired them improperly. Myth. Consumers prioritize convenience and cost when getting internet-connected products repaired. Fact. A recent Security Innovation Center study found 84% of Americans value the security of their data over convenience or speed of repair. AKA, we investigated our own self-interest and found out that the population actually agrees with us. Imagine that. Yeah, so we, we, we funded our own study to figure out if people agree with us. And we spoke to people who agreed with us. So I guess people agree with us. Americans, uh, I mean, this, this, is, this is such BS. So the, the first reason that's BS, you can have security convenience of repair at the same time. You can come to my store, not give me the password to your device, which is encrypted, so that I have no way of getting the data off of it, while simultaneously getting a speedy repair. When you send the product back to Apple, they often erase everything. Literally erase your data because they're taking your old board, they're tossing it out, and they're putting a new one in there. Just because they erase everything every time they touch it does not mean that it is more secure. That's a silly and asinine way to do things. There are many ways to value both security 
and convenience and speed of the repair at the exact same time. And this is something that you see in this particular video that I did, where I was going over the fact that they would have to uh, toss all the data off of the device to do something like a headphone jack repair. So to fix the headphone jack, my data is gone. That's not even security when dealing with data. That's just stupidity when dealing with data. Myth. If my internet-connected product is harmed during the repair, the only person affected is me. Fact. We live in a digital world where more than 20 billion products will be connected by, via the internet by 2020. When we connect to billions of products, they can connect to us. In an internet-enabled world, a compromised product not only affects the uh, owner of the product, but anyone whose information may be on it. And as we connect more things, from automobiles to buildings to appliances to farm equipment, those risks increase exponentially. Ultimately, a connected system of tens of billions of products presents massive opportunities while posing unprecedented risks. The health of our financial system, our collective privacy and economy are intertwined with how we approach the security of this integrated system. That's just fundamental fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So the idea there is if I fix your phone, somehow, by fucking with your phone, by replacing the TriStar chip on your phone so it can charge again, I could potentially be fucking with farming and our financial system and causing everything to entirely crash down. They're not giving a specific example. Honestly, they're not giving examples that ever actually occur. They're not using real examples because they don't have any. Internet-connected products are just like automobiles, so repair policy should be the same. Myth. Fact. There are no real similarities between the automobile repair legislation and the current electronics repair bills. That's bullshit, because our legislation is virtually a copy and paste of the 2012 auto repair bill. The automotive legislation passed in Massachusetts only applies to the unique characteristics of the automobile repair process, applying only to diagnostic scan tools and vehicle service information, whereas the current batch of legislative repair proposals apply to a vastly more complex range of products. The Massachusetts automotive law specifically excludes security systems and telematics, and it doesn't include a requirement for access to OEM parts. The national MOU stemming from the Massachusetts law applies to approximately 20 auto manufacturers while there are hundreds of electronics manufacturers in different sectors that would be impacted by the requirements of the electronics repair legislation. So they're saying that repair policies should be the same, and that's not true. That's a myth. But what they're arguing here is that the bill that we proposed is a bill that affects numerous different industries. So their fact isn't even really, isn't even really responding to their myth here. The, we're not saying that repair policies should be the same. This bill does not seek to set what the repair policies are. I'm not saying that you need to fix a phone the same way that you fix a car, the same way that you fix a tractor. What we're saying is that if you are going to go out of your way to make access to what we need to do our job unavailable so that you, the manufacturer, are the only one that's able to fix your product, no. Across the board, it doesn't matter what type of electronic repair product it is. It doesn't matter if it is a car, a tractor, a, a cell phone, whatever it is. You don't get to go out of your way to make the product impossible to repair by purposely designing it in a fashion where chips are not replaceable anymore because you told the manufacturer don't make them available to anybody. That's some, the, the premise, the fundamental philosophy is something here that is the same amongst the industries, but the policies are not going to be the same. Obviously, you're going to have different repair policies for fixing a car than you do fixing a MacBook. But yes, the overall philosophy there that you don't get to have a specific part in this car that is irreplaceable by anybody that is needed for the car to function that only the dealer can service. Absolutely. The philosophy is that whether you are an Apple store, Dell or John Deere, that should not happen. Proposed repair legislation would only require manufacturers to publish harmless repair schematics about their products. Myth. The government mandate would force manufacturers to reveal s sensitive technical information about their products, including source code. I'm sorry, I have to cut it off there. You are lying fucking sacks of shit. And th 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 there's no other way to put it. Nothing in these bills has ever, now nor in the future, will ever make it a requirement that source code is presented. None of these bills have asked for source code. In, under no circumstance would we be asking for source code in order to do our job. This is a lie. This is a filthy, dirty, and disgusting lie 
perpetrated by disingenuous lying sacks of shit. There's, there's, there's no way else to put it. This presents a security risk for the use of a product, the network, and other devices connected to the network, and could allow for tampering with firmware controls that protect copyrighted works. Again, if you're talking about security risks, and again, I'm accepting the premise of an asshole here with the source code thing. We're not asking for source code. The bill doesn't allow me to get access to source code. But if getting access to your source code means that what you made is less secure, you don't have a secure product. Manufacturers are intentionally designing electronic products to have short life cycles and are increasing the amount of e-waste our nation generates. Myth in the U.S., Electronic product manufacturers have developed robust policies and programs to ensure that they are continuously improving the sustainability of their products and reducing overall amounts of e-waste generated. Not only is repair and reuse in the manufacturer's best interest so that consumers can continue to use and enjoy their products, but many manufacturers are returning still useful electronic products to active service so they can get the maximum benefits out of the resources used to make them. Existing policies and programs promote repair and reuse of electronic products without the consumer safety, security, or privacy concerns raised by the proposed legislation. And again, I will point to this other video that I did where I, I call the manufacturers authorized service centers, and their response is all but go fuck yourself, buy a new one. Listen to the video. Listen to this video and tell me in your heart of hearts if you think that these manufacturers are not going out of their way to ensure that when your product breaks, that you buy a new one. And when I, this also ties into the idea that all of the that you're easily able to go to another service center, and this is something that I commented uh, on Reddit when someone was talking about one of these. IRP repair programs. This is this is a point that Apple's law has been mentioning quite a bit, and I've heard you know I've had little birdies tell me lobbies are lobbyists are whispering this point all the time that now Apple has this independent repair program and other manufacturers are probably going to follow suit. So there's no real problem. And I did a video on this when people who actually got access to that program signed up for it and told me what it was about. They broke their non-disclosure agreement with Apple. So these people risk legal liability with a $2 trillion company in order to tell us the truth. So firstly, when they create these independent repair programs that supposedly allow anybody to be able to work on the, the products if they sign up with the manufacturer, they gag these people so that they're not able to tell the world how unfixable these things are. How, how useless the programs are. But some brave souls reached out to me and confirmed what I've heard from many others. I posted this on Reddit. Let's go over it. So, firstly, this independent repair program, it does not cover MacBooks. It does not cover most parts of iPhones. At the time, it only covered the screen and the battery. It doesn't give you access to schematics. It doesn't get you access to chipsets. It requires that I give you, I give the manufacturer consumer data like their address, phone number, and contact information for each repair. You want your battery changed in your phone? I got to take down your home address, your full name, and your contact information and share it with the manufacturer, even if you bought the product used and don't want the manufacturer to know their info. They're, they're talking about security and privacy, but these manufacturer programs actually require more of your personal data than if you simply were to walk into an unauthorized store. The best part, you're not allowed to stock parts such as a battery without taking a customer device in first and then waiting a week for the part to arrive. Yes, you must order a part for the customer. You cannot keep it in stock so you can offer a turnaround time for less than a week. So the Apple Store can do a repair while you wait, but if you want it done by an IRP member, it will take a week. An IRP can't even replace the charge port on your iPhone 7, the headphone jack in your SE, or the power button in your iPhone 8. It is a worthless program from top to bottom. Now, what I... <sighs> What's really important to note here is that when I talk about these types of garbage documents, I talk about them in context of Apple. The reason that I spend a lot of time talking about Apple is because I can give you specific examples because I know what I'm talking about. If I were to talk about Dell or Toshiba or Lenovo or uh, many other companies, I'm not going to be able to give you those specific examples because I don't work on those products. I have an Apple product repair shop. So I will give you examples of when this happens with Apple products. However, the idea that this is only a problem with Apple would be incorrect. This is a problem that faces us with all different types of devices from all different types of manufacturers. I know Apple the best because I work on their products exclusively. Therefore, I'm able to give a good synopsis of why this is BS when applied to this particular company. But that doesn't mean that this is only a problem with Apple. The idea that you could simply move over to a different company and after moving over to a different company, your problems are gone, 
is not true. Even in other industries, this is the case. Tractors are doing this. Uh, medical equipment manufacturers are, are doing this. Consumer electronics manufacturers are doing this. And at some point, you will be at the point where if this disinformation continues moving forward, you don't get access to any ability to fix your own products anymore. Hell, you've heard that saying that at some point, you will own nothing and be happy. It starts with you will fix nothing and be happy. Because the thing is, if you want to make these radical changes in society that take away people's freedom, you have to understand how this works. You don't do it all at once. You do it really slowly. And you do it with the consent of the populace. And the way you get to a point where you own nothing and are happy, you start with you fix nothing and will be happy. And this is something that I would find particularly scary. We've seen recently that Silicon Valley companies are more than happy to remove and purge very large groups from the roles of people who are able to utilize their software. We also saw that with Airbnb recently. And the thing that kind of starts to get scary here, what if we really do move to a world where you don't own anything, where you don't own a vehicle? Well, first, we don't repair vehicles. Then you don't own the vehicle. Then you have to deal with a some sort of Silicon Valley ride-sharing app solution to be able to use a vehicle. And they have the right to tell you whether or not you're, you're, you're able to. Because they, they can just ban you from a service. And well, now you can't get around. Like Again, it seems weird to propose that now. It seems weird that I'm suggesting that. But we are giving these Silicon Valley companies and manufacturers more and more control over us with each passing day. And when you see how willing they are to ban people, to purge their roles of people for any reason, Eli the computer guy can do a video on how COVID should be taken seriously, how there should be some sort of emergency medical command set up because the NHS is getting overrun. After reading a news article, he gets called medical misinformation. He's on a second strike in a month. He's going to be gone from YouTube in a while. Uh, Because you have to understand, we're not just talking about repair here. We're slowly boiling the frog to the point where we won't own anything. And it's already been said at the World Economic Forum that at some point, we will not own anything and we will be happy. How do we avoid getting to the point where we don't own anything and are happy? We start here. We start by not allowing them to stick the tip in. And the way that they stick the tip in is by taking away our ability to fix what we, what we have right now. Because if we're not able to fix any of the devices that we own, then we don't own them. We rent them. They are slowly trying to get us to be okay with the idea that we don't own anything. We simply rent it from the manufacturer until it's time to purchase a new one. And I think it's time to start pushing back against this. If you have information below as to who funds the Security and Innovation Center and you can cite it, I would really like to see it. Further, if you know people who are not aware of this or are not aware that this type of bullshit is being peddled to keep people from being able to repair what they own, please do let people in your life know. Because again, you never know. The person that you know, maybe the friend of the cousin of the clerk for a senator that at some point in their life will have legislation related to this show up on their desk. And what would be important is for the people in their life to be able to tell them, oh, security and innovation center. No, 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 you, you, you can't, you can't listen to them. They're full of shit. And the way that happens is in a grassroots way of ensuring that as many people as humanly possible read this stuff and see it for the garbage that it is. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now. And as you can see, Blackberry is a kitten. She is the scaredest of all the kittens that I have. I have Oreo, Blackberry, and Mr. Clinton. And even Blackberry was not, never left the chair throughout listening to this entire fear-mongering because she is brave, she is not easily fooled, easily tricked, and she believes in right to repair. Blackberry. She also went up about 25% today, so there's that. Anyway, see you all in the next video. Bye now.